On this week's episode of Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast, Tesla continues on its relentless path of vertical integration by planning a potential lithium refinery in Texas. Plus, Tesla is finally happy with its battery supply situation, radar might be making a return in the next version of autopilot hardware, and more. What's happening, friends? I'm Ryan McCaffrey here with you for episode 372 of Ride the Lightning, your weekly Tesla unofficial podcast, September 18th, 2022. This will be my last podcast as a 41-year-old. I will turn 42 this coming week, so uh, hopefully I'll make this podcast a good one, but I am happy to be back with you. Hey, let me start with a couple of little uh, bits of bite-sized news before I get going. First, I noticed this when I was on Tesla's website this week, and that is this. Is Tesla's return policy back? Well, I mean, it's definitely, there is a policy right now, and my question is, has it been there and I've missed it? But I think this is new. Uh, this is a new, newly returned policy, though modified. So remember that Tesla used to have a seven-day or 1,000-mile return policy. But then they unceremoniously got rid of it, what, a year or two ago? So maybe this isn't new, but I, when I was on the Tesla site this week, right on the homepage, tesla.com, I noticed that the at the very bottom of each of the cars on the homepage, S3, X, Y, although I guess three is on top, that doesn't matter. Uh, but in the bottom left in small print, this is on desktop, by the way, it says, if you haven't test driven the car, you can return it within three days of delivery. So that might be new. Again, my apologies if it's not, if that's been there and I've only just now noticed it, but I believe that is either brand new or relatively new, the return of the return policy. Now, if it's like the old return policy at all, if you were to actually utilize this and return a car, you won't be able to order another one for a year if you return it, which as you can imagine, Tesla does to try and keep people from either, uh, you know, just getting super nitpicky with cars, like, oh, this one's got one panel that's slightly off. Return, just give me another one. So Tesla doesn't want that. They want to sell cars, not make them and have them return and then have to deal with them all over again. So that is good to see. I mean, they. I'm glad that they do have a return policy. You know, three days might not seem like much. Uh, now, I should add, they don't specify a mileage limit, at least not on the right on the homepage there. So you could you could get a, a, a pretty darn good feel for it and a good number of miles under your belt in three days to make a, a real formal decision of if indeed you're going to keep the car. And obviously Tesla is confident that most people are going to choose to keep the car. Also this week, quick nugget, a quick public service announcement for you. Elon Musk has given an update on when more people will be able to qualify for the full self-driving beta. He tweeted 10.69.2.1 coming out in a few days with additional polish. Uh, 10.69.2 is out now. I've got it. I'll tell you a little bit about my impressions with it towards the end of the podcast. And then Elon says 10.69.3 comes out shortly after AI Day, which is September 30th. And then he added in a follow-up tweet, beta expanding to safety scores above 80 after 10.69.2.1 goes out. Meaning, possibly by the time you hear this, 10.69.2.1 will be out and the beta will expand to presumably anyone with 81 or up. Now, maybe it'll be 80, but just taking his wording very literally there, Safety scores above 80, so that would that would indicate that it does not include 80. Maybe it will, but 81 and up for sure are going to be able to get in here in again any minute now. By the time all of you hear this, 
So that is good news. I mean, if you've been struggling with your safety score for any reason, a friend of mine actually was just texting me before I sat down to record tonight, telling me exactly that, that he's been having trouble uh, with his safety score. And I know for a lot of you, including my friend, it's it's basically out of your control. Like the 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 dings to your score are largely out of your control with regard to the actions of other drivers and or the quirks of your local roads and the way that, you know, you just end up getting dinged for stuff. So for all of you out there, this will no doubt be welcome news. And it's a solid step towards Elon's stated goal of opening up the beta to any FSD owner or subscriber who wants it by the end of the year. Two more quick bites for you. First of all, I hope all of you ludicrous tier backers and higher on my Patreon had fun with this week's lightning round mini episode. It was about what the Tesla Fremont factory tour is like in the multiple times over the years that I've had the pleasure of doing them, uh, including I spent, I even go all the way back to my first factory tour in 2011 before the Model S even went into production when the place was almost literally completely empty. So if you're interested in those in those uh, weekly mini episodes, bonus mini episodes, they are on my Patreon at patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. If you back me at the ludicrous tier or higher, the $10 a month tier or higher, you get access to all of those including all the ones to come each and every week, along with, of course, early access to each week's podcast. And finally, before I get going with the proper news this week, just a quick one more PSA. TeslaCon Florida is coming up, and I will be there as a featured speaker. The organizers were very gracious to invite me. My flight is booked. It's all set. It's happening October 21st and 22nd at Cape Canaveral. If you'd like to learn more, go to teslaconflorida.com. I really hope I get to meet a bunch of you there. That is going to be fun, fun stuff. Okay, let's get into the Tesla news for the week. First up, Tesla will make one of its biggest, most significant vertical integration moves yet by refining its own lithium. The story was broken via Bloomberg, who writes, Tesla is plotting a potential lithium refinery on the Gulf Coast of Texas, a move that would bolster the company's battery production efforts and further expand its footprint in the state. The electric car maker has told officials that it's considering constructing a, quote, battery-grade lithium hydroxide refining facility, end quote, in Nusas County, and I'm probably mispronouncing that county name, so Texas residents, anybody in that county, I do apologize, according to a newly public application for tax breaks filed with the Texas Comptroller's office. Tesla pitched it as, quote, the first of its kind in North America. If built, Tesla told the state that the facility would process the raw ore material into a state suitable for battery production. The resulting lithium hydroxide it creates would be, quote, packaged and shipped by truck and rail to various Tesla battery manufacturing sites, supporting the necessary supply chain for large-scale and electric vehicle batteries, end quote. Tesla also said the process, will u- the process it will use is, quote, innovative and designed to consume less hazardous reagents and create usable byproducts compared to the conventional process, end quote. Construction could begin as soon as the fourth quarter of this year, 2022, but wouldn't reach commercial production until the fourth quarter of 2024. Tesla has told the state that the facility could be located, quote, anywhere with access to the Gulf Coast shipping channel, but that the company is evaluating a competing site in Louisiana. So a little, hey... You know, you want which side of the border do you want it to be on? Give us a little, you know, a little break, little tax break, little something, something here to make it worth our while. If you've been following along with this podcast, as I'm sure most of you have for at least a little while, and you've been listening to clips of Elon on the quarterly earnings calls recently, this move will not surprise you in the slightest. Elon has repeatedly made open calls to anyone willing to invest and get into the lithium business, calling it a, quote, license to print money on repeated occasions, as you'll recall, because of what? The sudden 
and now, well, not sudden, but it's it, the, the need has suddenly spiked on a global scale for lithium, not just from Tesla, but from everybody. Now, we know how Tesla has vertically integrated almost every aspect of its business at this point. So it is, again, completely expected that they would extend that into the raw material mining and, and refining itself. I mean, this is probably, I guess I shouldn't say mining. It's refining that they're, that they're talking about here. I mean, but, but this is probably a good thing because not only because it will help Tesla secure more lithium for more batteries, but because they've pledged to refine it in a more responsible, more eco-friendly way as well. And from a business perspective, just to, just to look at it from the, the ledger, it should help keep Tesla's costs down with other suppliers by way of being able to secure this stuff themselves, although they obviously won't be mining all of the lithium they need. They won't be able to get, refine, mine, refine everything they need. They're gonna need every bit they can get from any supplier willing to make a fair deal with them. But I guess my point here is that by Tesla themselves being in that refining space, it should, in theory, help uh, them secure and negotiate fairer contracts for themselves because they could say, well, you know, we we we're in this ourselves now. We could just we could we we could leave you out and we'll just mine, you know, we'll we'll refine ourselves and maybe go with your competitor. Should help them out with the uh, the contract making process. I would look at this project like the Gigafactories. This Texas operation, unless it ends up in Louisiana, but wherever it is, this is going to be the prototype, right? The version one of this. After it gets rolling, presumably in 2024, Tesla is almost certainly going to look to build more refining facilities. And then when they do that, build them in even better and more efficient and more eco-friendly and sustainable ways. I got to figure maybe Nevada could be the next place that they go looking for, for a second site given that they have Giga Nevada there already making batteries and Tesla themselves has a claim to a huge plot of land in that state for lithium sourcing uh, purposes. So that's, that's the most obvious second site I think we can look to sitting here in 2022, trying to, to forecast this out by a couple of years. And just to wrap up this story, to me, this is reason number, oh, I don't know, what are we up to? 6,532, I'm not quite sure what reason number this is. But way down the list now, for reasons that Tesla is going to continue to stay ahead in the electric vehicle business, even as other companies finally start to get serious about it. And it's because Tesla is going the extra mile that it needs to go to in order to have everything it needs to increase production. All of the other car companies, every single one of them, whether they're an EV startup like Rivian or like Lucid or whether they're an established player like Ford or BMW or Volkswagen Group or whomever, they are all gonna be fighting over the limited supply of third-party battery cells from people like Panasonic, people like LG. Tesla has deals already with all of those companies. So if it comes to it, they can build and all the cash they have on hand that you hear about on every single earnings call, Tesla will be able to afford to just outbid everyone else if they need to, thanks to those massive profits per vehicle, thanks to that cash on hand, the billions and billions in the bank. And they're so far ahead now, Tesla is, in terms of making their own battery cells, not just in general, not just on a macro level, but specifically when we zero in on that 4680 battery cell as well, which as we all have learned, is designed to be cheaper and be a better cell. So it's just, it's, it's advantage Tesla all the way down the vertical integration chart here. All of this to sum up, or to conclude, I guess I'll say, all of this gives me hope that maybe Tesla hasn't given up just yet on the idea of building 
a really, really great and compelling $25,000 electric vehicle. Uh, although we're going to hear more on that in just a minute. Uh, but And when I say really great, I'm talking 300-mile range, a car that's a mic drop moment for the EV and, and a, a nail in the coffin, a final nail in the coffin for the economics of the internal combustion engine vehicle. Because currently, as we all know, Tesla's only selling luxury cars that they've been raising the prices on for a while now because the demand for them allows them to just stay in that luxury market. They don't really need to come down as of yet. But if and when the day comes that they are finally ready to move down market and strike that killing blow to the internal combustion engine car from a, again, from an economic perspective, a a TCO perspective, they will be very, very well positioned to to do it. Now, I'm not saying that other companies can't or won't make an affordable EV. Chevy is already offering the 2023 Bolt at $25,000 before any tax credits. And it's by all accounts, a very solid car but Tesla could make a significantly better one for the same price thanks to all of the battery and vertical integration enhancements and cost reduction efforts that they've been doing. So when the time finally comes, the Tesla's ready and willing to do it, they're gonna be in position to make one heck of a car. Now, next up, uh, a related story here, actually the next couple of stories all sort of tie into each other. I saw this on the Tesla Motors Reddit and it came from Business Insider. A Tesla executive says battery supply has improved so much that the company can buy all the cells it needs for the first time in years. Quote, for the first time I can remember, we can access all the supply we need for both businesses, said Martin Vietcha, the vice president of investor relations for Tesla on uh, this past week during a presentation at the Goldman Sachs Tech Conference here in San Francisco. This comes according to a person who attended the event. Now, both businesses, it means the car business and the energy business, meaning the power walls. The executive was asked, Business Insider writes, what helped improve Tesla's access to this supply? He said, Tesla expanded the number of its suppliers in recent years from just Panasonic to multiple battery makers, again, as I was talking about just a few minutes ago, including CATL and LG Chem. He added that these companies were building capacity, quote, super fast and predicted Tesla would add even more suppliers. Tesla relies heavily on batteries to make its vehicles and ramp up production. Rising supply should help the company. Gee, thanks, Business Insider, for that (laughs) <laughs> that incredible insight. Anyway, I, I shouldn't, sorry, that's mean. I shouldn't say that. Indeed, Vietcha said, mon, said this past week that the EV industry would grow only as fast as battery supplies could grow. Quote, this is the most important part of how this industry can grow in the future, he said, adding that this included not just building cells and battery packs, but also designing batteries as well as refining and mining lithium, nickel, and other raw materials. Quote, if the industry can 10x from here, the supply chain will need to 10x as well, Vietcha said. And so again, all tying back into that first story with the lithium refining facility that Tesla is eyeing in the Gulf Coast of Texas slash Louisiana. And here... You can see why Elon and the Tesla team have been so laser focused on scaling up this year. That's all we've heard from Elon on the earnings calls. Scale up, scale up, scale up in 2022. I mean, it was it was just an earnings call or two ago that Elon said 2022 is all about scaling up and that 2023 would be all about shipping new products like the Cybertruck that so many of you are waiting for. I mean, Tesla knows they know well in advance what the supply is going to look like for the most part. I mean, when there are unforeseen circumstances that happen like the pandemic, but generally speaking, you know, Tesla has a forecast. They know what's coming supply wise. And so they've been planning for this. They've been preparing for this, this supply spike, this, this ramp up for a long time. And for all the talk that somehow we all keep hearing about, 
oh, just wait until the established automakers start building EVs. Then it'll be game over for Tesla. But what those people fail to take into account, and I'm being serious here, I know I'm using kind of a sarcastic tone, but in all seriousness, what those people, I think, are short-sightedly failing to take into account is this very thing that Martin is talking about, supply. Because almost no one else is building their own battery plant. Ford says it's going to, GM says it's going to, but I'm not even sure, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not even sure if any of them have even put shovels in the ground yet. And that right there is the difference between Tesla and everybody else. Like right, right there, you can stop, there are other differences. But fundamentally, as Martin was saying, with regard to the battery supply being the thing, you can just stop the discussion, stop the argument right there. By building its own battery factories around the world, multiple battery factories, by developing its own cheaper to make and easier to make cells, and soon refining, perhaps even mining its own lithium, plus being able, as I said, to outbid anybody else for contracts with third-party suppliers like Panasonic or LG if they need to, the fact is Tesla is going to remain in the pole position in the electrification race in the automotive industry for many, many years. The competition is coming, but it's still in the rearview mirror for Tesla. Uh, to quote a famous movie, he who, con he who controls the spice controls the universe. Obviously, the spice in this case being the battery supply. But, I mean, I'm laughing, but I'm serious. Like, that, the, the Dune line works right there. And so, while all of the other automakers are busy bidding against each other to try and get a share of whatever the third-party battery companies can make, Tesla will have third-party cells and its own cells which means that other automakers are just going to have a much, much more difficult time. Ultimately, at the end of the day, a tougher time producing high volumes of EVs than Tesla has. Tesla's already doing it. No one else is doing it. Think about that. It's great to see the Mustang Mach-E. It's great to see the Bolt. It's great to see the ID4. But none of these cars are produced at the volume... I mean, to use one of Elon's favorite phrases, Tesla is manufacturing their EVs and at an order of magnitude higher than anyone else's. And that's got to change for the, the race, the, the future of electrification and, and the, the acceleration of sustainable transport. That's got to change. So I'm not trying to slam the other companies or, or knock them down a peg or root against them, but that is the reality right now. And that, I think, is the piece of the puzzle that a lot of the Tesla doubters out there fail to see. Staying, as I promised, on this similar thread of Tesla doing the legwork to get ahead, stay ahead of the competition. And in fact, uh, it's another quote. This next story is another quote from Martin at that same event. Tesla's cost to produce a vehicle has been slashed by nearly 60% in just five years. I saw this story on Drive Tesla Canada who writes, when Tesla entered production hell with the ramp of the Model 3 in 2017, each vehicle that rolled off the production line in Fremont was being sold at a loss. According to VP, the well, Martin, we have already introduced him, who spoke at a Goldman Sachs conference in San Francisco, each Model 3 cost $84,000 to build. However, Musk's vision of automation and manufacturing simplification has paid off, and in the five years since the Model 3 was introduced, that cost has shrunk more than 57% to just $36,000 per vehicle. What makes these massive savings even more remarkable is that none of it came from cheaper battery costs, traditionally the most expensive part of the car to produce. Martin said the savings were realized from their new Gigafactory design and simplified vehicle design, making manufacturing easier and quicker. He also added that as their purpose-built Gigafactories ramp and produce more cars, that $36,000 cost will shrink even further. 
But Vietje also pointed out that these low costs will not translate to a, into a new cheaper model Tesla in the near future. This is because of the extremely high demand of the Model 3 and Model Y, which has been stronger than expected and quote, reduces the need for a new model anytime soon, according to Martin, end quote. Well, first of all, it's no wonder that Tesla almost went bankrupt in 2017 when Elon tells that story of how close they were to death. I mean, that's quite a loss they were eating on each car. Because just to, just to take you back, the base price of the Model 3 in 2017, they were only making one variant of it. And it was the long range rear wheel drive. That was the only Model 3 made for the first year of production. Then the dual motors and the dual motor performance were introduced. And those rear wheel drive long range cars were priced at $50,000 uh, before you could add the 19 inch sport wheels if you wanted. There was only the black interior, so there was no interior choice. And then you could add the software packages of enhanced autopilot and full self-driving. But that was it. It was just the 18-inch wheels, 19-inch wheels, and your paint color, I guess, as well. That, that, would add, that could add cost to the car and obviously be a manufacturing variable. But that was it at the time. So, yeah, that's $50,000 cars that were costing them $84 each to make. So that's a heck of a loss. Now, second of all on this, let me zero in on Martin's last comment there about continued strong demand negating Tesla's need to build a cheaper car anytime soon. Martin might have said the quiet part out loud here. I mean, we've seen the $25,000 car talked about, the so-called, but definitely not really called the Model 2, but we've seen that car go from being touted at Battery Day it was part of the battery day presentation to more recently completely disappearing from any of Tesla's earnings calls and shareholder letters and Elon tweets. Well, now we know why, or at least the probable reason why that it's, it's a reasonable to suspect this. And it's because Tesla doesn't need to build a $25,000 car when they're selling every 50 plus thousand dollar car that they can make and will likely continue to do so for the foreseeable future. And I suppose this is where the business need actually clashes with the company's mission statement. And thankfully, that doesn't seem to happen very often. Most of the time, I think it's fair to say that those two things are able to work in concert together, complementing each other. But here, but in my view, they are butting heads. The business need and the mission statement are, are not uh, together. They are, they are clashing. Sure, Tesla could probably build the $25,000 car, but the margins on it would either be significantly lower, assuming that Tesla will continue to get the cost to build the Model 3 down lower over time, as Martin suggested there, that, uh, you know, a, a new smaller, slightly smaller car with fewer batteries in it, more advanced manufacturing processes, maybe either Tesla's building them for tiny margin, no margin, or a loss like the Model 3s were in 2017. I'm not sure, but the fact is, as we, as the market stands now, Tesla can make more money for their shareholders by utilizing their growing but ultimately still limited production resources to make more expensive cars that the company makes a higher profit on. And that's, that's just the business reality right now. But as I said earlier in the podcast, I really do hope that eventually Tesla does build that $25,000 car. Honestly, I think they'll, they'll, they'll have to. I mean, I've, I've said this on the podcast before as well, but they're gonna need more vehicles in more segments in order to reach their goal of making 20 million, 20 million, by the way, again, we're not even at two yet. They're going Tesla's gonna hit two million cars and surpass two next year. But 20 million cars a year by 2030 is the goal. But it just, it certainly doesn't seem like the $25,000 vehicle is gonna come along anytime soon. I think the robo-taxi vehicle that Elon mentioned recently 
That to me seems like a big wild card, as does, in my opinion, I'm not trying to knock it, but the Optimus bot. Because, like, that's just a complete potential game changer, but it's it's a thing that's, there is no market for, market segment. There's no established market segment for that. Tesla would be creating an entirely new market, which they've done before, so we'll see what happens with that. But in terms of other vehicles in the foreseeable future, you've, of course, got the Cybertruck entering production next year, as all of you know, because many of you are waiting for it. The Tesla Semi as well next year. And then the Roadster either at the end of next year or sometime in 2024, which that's my guess. I I just don't see... Like if you look... I mean, I've been talking about it on the podcast, right? All these Cybertruck sightings of... What was it? Just a week or two ago, I talked about the engineering team unloading one off a truck that that had uh, all kinds of imaging equipment strapped to it. And we've seen prototype and pre-production Cybertrucks out. They've been photographed, doing work. And that, and that truck is supposed to come out in less than one year from now, about nine months from now. The Roadster has, there's ne- it's never been seen on the roads, or at least Nothing but the prototype has ever been spotted. And in fact, the last time the prototype was even seen was, gosh, I actually don't remember the last time. Oh, I guess that's right. It was at the Giga Texas, uh, the Cyber Rodeo. All right, fair enough. It was at Cyber Rodeo, but again, just on display. My point is there are no roadsters being photographed or, you know, spy shots or out on the roads doing any sort of testing. Whereas the Cybertruck, we've been seeing that for a period of months now, and thus uh, using that as some sort of barometer of where Tesla is in the process, I just don't think the Roadster is going to happen. I don't think it's going to come out next year. I think it's going to be 2024. But anyway, that's the upcoming lineup. And so it seems like it might be a little while before we see another passenger vehicle after the Roadster. Notice I say passenger vehicle because who knows what's going to happen with the robo taxi, which I guess technically that is a passenger vehicle, but it's not one you can actually drive yourself. So maybe maybe passenger vehicle is not the right term for that. Maybe driver's vehicle, a vehicle with a wheel, with a steering wheel on it. But anyway, uh, but I'll tell you, all that said, that's part of why I love covering this company week after week, because you never quite know what they're going to do, and that's part of the fun. Okay, the final story I've got for you this week comes from our white hat hacker friend, Green the Only, who has made a very interesting new discovery in, of all places, the Model X electronic parts catalog. And Green has discovered a new HD radar module for autopilot. Green took to Twitter, as he always does, to post a picture of that parts catalog page before it was taken down, and he said, quote, looks like the new Tesla radar just made an appearance on the Tesla electronic parts catalog. Model S also has it, but there's no picture, meaning in that catalog, in that electronic parts catalog. As a follow-up, by the way, to the surprise of nobody, uh, the... Oh, sorry, this is still his quote. As a follow-up to the surprise of nobody, the picture of the radar from the FCC application matches what's pictured in the electronic parts catalog. And then when uh, Green was asked by another Twitter user if he thought that radar would be back for Hardware 4, Green replied simply, yes. And then another person asked if he thought that Tesla would retrofit it to the older cars. And Green said, quote, depends on if it uses the same harness, which it probably does not. So very interesting turn of events here. It would seem that at least on some level, Tesla may effective, I'm I'm speculating here, but it seems as though Tesla may effectively have two different autopilot systems in the near future. I mean, I guess technically three if we count the legacy autopilot one cars 
that use the mobilized system that's no longer receiving any updates. So nobody's working on that anymore. And so my point is two systems being worked on in parallel, in tandem. You'd have the hardware three cars and the hardware four cars. Of course, the hardware three cars will operate on vision only. The hardware four cars, it would seem, will probably also operate on a much higher resolution vision system, but also with this HD radar system to augment it, which of course, uh, that would be very useful for inclement weather. That's the big one, is the radar can see better in poor visibility conditions than the cameras can. And the other cool part about radar, as many of you may remember from back when Tesla was first hyping radar as a, as a big new addition to autopilot, is it bounces, it can bounce its signal under the car in front of you to see two cars ahead of you. And thus, if the car, two cars ahead panic stops, your car can start braking right away and have a much higher likelihood of avoiding a rear end collision with the car immediately in front of you. So uh, Tesla hardware four cars would get features like that back. And will this mean now that the autopilot team at Tesla is gonna need to grow by possibly quite a bit in order to support the development of two systems concurrently once hardware four does roll out because there's clearly still plenty of work to go with our cars now on hardware three, despite the certainly the clear and obvious progress that's being made. But if hardware four has different and better hardware, which it does, that's there's no speculation needed there, it's better. I'm sure that Tesla is going to want to specifically take advantage of that because they wouldn't go to the expense of installing that better hardware in cars otherwise. You know, this is possibly a terrible analogy, but to relate it to my world, my day job world in the video game industry, I wonder if it's fair to think of hardware four, like the PlayStation five and hardware three, as the PlayStation 4. They might architecturally be similar at their core, but the PlayStation 5, the hardware 4, is faster, outputs at higher resolutions, and has additional features that can be taken advantage of that the, hard, that the PS4, aka hardware 3, can't take advantage of, like the HD radar system that hardware 4 will seemingly have, and to finish the analogy, like the PlayStation 5 has hardware ray tracing in the in the machine that the PlayStation 4 doesn't have and can't do. So, uh, you know, maybe that's a fair analogy, maybe not. Maybe at worst, it's a it's a reasonable general analogy that helps you wrap your head a bit uh, around it a bit better. Anyway, uh, to conclude here, I want to say I can't wait to see what hardware 4 is capable of. Because again, we've seen the progress over the past year. I mean, from when I got into the beta, it, actually I'm coming up on one year. I think many of us are coming up on one year in the FSD beta program. I've got about a month to go. I got in at the end of October. So yeah, I'm about 11 months in and certainly I remember those first drives with it and comparing it to where it was then to where it is now, it's a huge improvement. It's a massive difference. So to see where the autopilot team is gonna be able to take this when they have way better hardware to play with in the hardware four cars at some point, that's gonna be pretty cool. Now, I was on a uh, Patreon Zoom call with one of the, uh, the Roadster and Space Tier backers, Lawton from Chicago, who I, I adore talking to. He's, he's a, an absolute sweetheart of a person I love talking about uh, Tesla and talking about life with him. And we were just talking about this and uh, th and we were discussing, well, how is this gonna roll out? How is hardware four gonna roll out? Will it in fact debut in the Cybertruck and then later come to the other four cars? Well, after Lawton and I got done talking, I think where we both landed 
was that I I have to imagine it's going to go into the lower volume vehicles first because it's bound to slow down production a little bit, right? At least at first, because it's, you know, if it's new wiring harness, new, you know, possibly additional cameras in additional places, it's just going to be a change to the manufacturing process and on some level, uh, to some degree. And so it probably makes sense that Tesla would roll it out on the S and the X first, possibly at the same time as the Cybertruck, since you know Cybertruck's going to start production pretty slowly. And then there's the fact that Elon has said in the past that S and X would always get the newest bells and whistles first, uh, and then they'd move down to the other cars in time. And this would be a perfect example of that because you can't risk slowing down production on the high volume cars. That's what's making the company all the money is the three and the Y. So that's why I believe that it'll be either the Cybertruck S and X at the same time next summer when the Cybertruck starts production, or it's, it's definitely also possible that two other ways that the Cybertruck will in fact be first and then the S and the X will follow soon after and then after that, the three and the Y. Or it's also possible that the S and the X get it first next spring maybe or early summer ahead of the Cybertruck start of production. Then Cybertruck starts ramping up with it and then once Tesla feels comfortable with the you know, the, the manufacturing adjustments and the change uh, that they need to make on the production side, then it goes into the three and the Y as well. But one thing is certain, barring any leaks, because, you, you know, leaks happen. I mean, look at the iPhone every year leaks now, even though Apple's one of the biggest companies. So we'll see about leaks. But in terms of Tesla's own messaging, you can guarantee that they're not going to say a word about hardware for until it's shipping in cars. Because that's how they handled, for two reasons. One, that's how they handled it with hardware three. Remember, it was it was at Autonomy Day in early 2019 that they said, oh, here's our new full self-driving computer and it's shipping in cars now. And of course, the reason that they do that is so that they're, they don't Osborne themselves. They don't cause the Osborne effect and cause orders to dry up while people wait for hardware four, especially if there's not gonna be a retrofit, which I'll, I'll uh, get to that in a second and your thoughts on that, I should say in a second. So um, yeah, I think Tesla's gonna keep it as close to the chest as they possibly can. And, it's, uh, and we're just gonna hear about it at some point. And if there are no leaks, it may even be that the first cars just have it and somebody finds it like on their, on their screen, like going into their, you know, their, the details of their car and it says full self-driving computer two, you know, which, you know, you can, you can find that in your car now where it says full self-driving computer installed. So it, that Tesla will keep this close to the chest. Now, uh, all of you Cybertruck reservation holders, at least, you know, you can get excited knowing that your future stainless steel truck is at least 95% likely to be equipped with hardware for I would actually put that at 99% myself. Can't say 100 for sure because I'm not Tesla. I don't work for Tesla. But there's, it would just make no sense to ship a small number of Cybertrucks with hardware 3, especially if there's no upgrade path, and then the rest of them are hardware 4. So it's almost certain that, that uh, all the Cybertrucks are going to be hardware 4. And uh, now, assuming there's no upgrade path from hardware 3 to hardware 4, the question for current Tesla owners is, if Hardware 4 offers tangibly better autopilot and FSD in the next, say, two to five years, would you upgrade to a new Tesla in that window? Well, I asked that very question as this week's Patreon poll, and the results are as follows. With just under 150 votes, 54% of respondents vote no, they will not be upgrading their car just for hardware four, 18% say yes, 27% say I'm optimistic that there will be an upgrade path for my current car. So thank you everybody for going to the Patreon page at patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. 
to vote. Again, a friendly reminder, you do not need to be a Patreon backer in order to vote in each week's Patreon poll. I try to get that that poll posted on either Tuesday or Wednesday evening each week, so that's when to look for it. All right, that's everything I've got for you in another busy week of Tesla news. Stick with me, though. I've got your Ride the Lightning Hotline calls coming up right after this. But first, a quick word once again from my friends at AccelerateAuto.com. Hang on. As you've heard on the last couple of shows, all September long, Ride the Lightning is brought to you by AccelerateAuto.com and their X-Care extended warranties for EVs. So as many of you know, like me, coming out of your factory warranty on your Model 3, Tesla doesn't offer their own extended warranty anymore. So here comes Accelerate, X-C-E-L, a company started by a couple of people that worked at Tesla back in the early Model S days and helped launch Tesla's original leasing program, in fact. They're also longtime Tesla owners themselves, so X-Care is built specifically for EVs and offered, uh, offers coverage for up to 10 years, up to 175,000 miles with a $100 deductible. By design, it mirrors what Tesla had, the, the extended service plan that Tesla themselves won't offer anymore, so it just tries to basically be that for you. It covers everything minus things like cosmetic damage, rattles and consumables. So no brakes and tires, no 12 volt batteries, but uh, Xcare has now helped pay for hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of service. And they typically see things like MCU replacements, onboard computer systems for the three and the Y, door handles in the Model S, AC and HVAC issues, air suspension, and more. They also, by the way, facilitate leasing for both consumers and businesses that are looking for more creative leasing solutions than a cookie cutter approach. In fact, unlike Tesla's leases, Accelerate allows you to buy the car at the end of the term if you want to. So learn more, find the right extended warranty plan for you and your Tesla at accelerateauto.com slash xcare. That's spelled X-C-E-L-E-R-A-T-E-A-U-T-O dot com slash X-C-A-R-E, and use the discount code LIGHTNING to get $100 off the purchase of your policy. I've got a plan myself now for another three years. So check that out if that is of interest to you for that peace of mind. Thank you to Accelerate Auto. All right, there was a ton of news to cover this week, so I'll get to as many phone calls as I can here in the Ride the Lightning Hotline. I've got plenty of good ones teed up, so thanks to everybody who called in. But feel free to call in. If you heard something earlier in the show that you'd like to respond to or you've got a question, comment, discussion topic, give me a call. There are two easy ways to do that. Either use your smartphone's built-in voice recording software, record your question on your phone. Please keep it to 90 seconds or less so that I can get to as many people each week as possible. And then email that file to me at teslapodcast at gmail.com. Or you can take that same 90 second or less phone call and leave a message on the Ride the Lightning hotline itself. It is a toll-free number that's available to you anytime, and that number is 1-888-989-8752. Again, that's 1-888-989-TSLA. And if you know someone special with an upcoming birthday, anniversary, graduation, or some other special occasion, you can give them a unique gift of recorded voices from friends and family telling them why they're special. The recordings can be podcasted or put onto a keepsake. Visit lifeonrecord.com to learn more. Kicking it off this week with Ethan from Redding, California, who has a feature request. Hey, Ryan, this is Ethan from Redding, California. Just calling in with a quick uh, feature request here. Um, I got a kid always sitting in the back in the car seat. She's young enough that she can't complain when she gets too hot. And the Tesla automatically tries to automatically turn the air on and off when there's occupants in the back seat. But because she's small enough and she's light enough, it doesn't always catch her. And so my wife and I are always having to go into the tab, two or three tabs in, make sure it's on. And every now and then we'll fill the car and park and then just continue on our way and it'll shut it off again. And we won't know and our kid's getting too hot in the back. So I was wondering if Tesla can just 
have an option that if there's a car seat in the back, you know, you've, we've marked it, there's a car seat. Like if there's a car seat, just always turn the air on back there. I'd rather it be on too often than not enough. Um, well, here's hoping that something like this can get implemented and thanks for all you do. Ethan, I have run into this as well, albeit with my dog, not with a baby, but dogs and babies alike both need to stay cool back there. So yes, I think your feature suggestion is a very sound one. And tying it to the car seat selector in the UI does seem like a really smart way to go about it. So here's hoping that the right folks at Tesla hear this. And thank you very much, Ethan, for calling in. Next up, Peter from Amory, Wisconsin. Hello, Ryan. This is Peter from Amory, Wisconsin. I hope all is well. I'm calling about a somewhat annoying service experience that kind of may be a tip for others. Long and short of it is that, among other issues, um, our vehicle has had some problems. Um, our Model Y, it, uh, one of the cameras and sensors has not been working, and uh, things like a window or the chair will suddenly start moving, like the window will roll down without pressing any buttons or the chair will start moving back and forth slowly, um, even though we have our preferences set to the profile. So it's been a little bit annoying, and so we scheduled the service appointment, and we found out that the service team needs to know exactly when some of these issues happen. So they were looking for specific dates and times, and we did not know this, and this has been going on for a while, so we really had no idea when when these issues happen. And more or less, they have been unable to help us so far because they need these dates. And we then had to cancel our one appointment that we could make on Labor Day because we live pretty far from the service appointment and we are both work. So unfortunately, we haven't gotten the help that we need so far. And it's a little bit frustrating. And the tip to everyone is that if you ever have any issues with anything in the vehicle, I would suggest that you write it down maybe some notepad or uh, your phone so that you can provide all these detailed this detailed information to the service team. Hope that helps everyone. And I don't know if everyone has had similar experiences, but we hope that the issue gets fixed soon. I hope you have a good day and uh, I'll see you or well, I look forward to listening to the podcast. Bye-bye. Peter, I have had a similar experience myself, in fact. I'm really sorry to hear about your frustration. I mean, it's quite understandable, given the unpredictable nature of your problem and the fact that getting to the service center at all is not easy for you to do. I have never seen a Tesla's log files, personally, but they just, I have to presume, they must be filled with a lot of noise. Otherwise, the service team wouldn't need to ask you for a date and a time for them to pinpoint it. When I had my autopilot failures on the way to and from Pebble Beach like a month ago, service did ask me for specific times that it happened uh, after I made the appointment. And I only had those times because I happened to have taken a picture of the notification screen in the car with my phone. If I had, and those were time stamped, obviously. If I hadn't done that, I wouldn't really have known where to point them and it would have taken longer to resolve my situation. So your suggestion for others here is a really good one. Conversely, I'd also like to hope that Tesla will make it easier for service to find abnormalities in customer car logs, either through, I don't know, a different tagging system on certain error codes or something else. I mean, that could help a lot of people avoid a similar situation. It shouldn't be the customer's responsibility to provide the exact day and time of a problem when the car does have all of that information stored in it. So good luck, Peter. Uh, it honestly sounds like your Model Y is haunted by spirits. I, I hope the service team can help you exercise those demons. Next up here is Steve from New Jersey. Uh, responding to Brad from two or three shows back, Brad's issue with podcasts not continuing to the latest episode. Go ahead, Steve. Hi, Ryan. This is Steve from New Jersey, and I wanted to respond to, I believe it was Brad had a problem with podcasts not continuing to the latest episode. I have the same issue in my Model X, and the workaround that I found is to go to the current episode and scroll all the way to the end and let it finish playing and then it will automatically continue on to the latest episode even though it doesn't appear anywhere and there's no way to get to it directly thanks for all you do hope that helps 
Nothing for me to add to this one. Steve, this is very kind of you to call in with this workaround. Thank you very much for doing that. The last call I'm going to have time for this week is David G. from Grand Rapids talking safety score. Hey, Ryan, this is David G. from Grand Rapids again. There's a lot of talk about the safety score, but I don't know if I'm missing something here. So I'm trying to get the full self-driving beta. So I'll take off in my car, go for a drive, come back home, check my safety score, and see that it's less than 100%. And then I got to try to figure out what I did wrong and go out again, come back, check the score again, and see if I improved. Am I missing something? Why doesn't the UI, the user interface, tell you if you're doing something wrong? I was thinking, why doesn't the the cars around you show up in red if you're too close to them or if you're approaching too close or if you're accelerating too fast? I mean, the bar at the top already shows you uh, black or green. Uh, why can't it show red, too, if you're accelerating too fast? Um, another problem that I seem to have is in my Model Y, I can't seem to hold the steering wheel tight enough to make it register that I, uh, for when I'm on autopilot, uh, I was thinking that why couldn't the little blue steering wheel have like a green ring around it to show you if you are actually uh, holding it or if it's actually registering your, your grip on it. Uh, just some thoughts there. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate the podcast. David, I think this is a very fair bit of criticism about the safety score and also a couple of good UI suggestions to boot. You're right. I mean, the whole point of the safety score is to be safer. And the car is logging your driving in real time. So why doesn't it show you your mistakes in real time so that you know how to quickly correct them? It would not only be helpful for folks like yourself that are trying to get access to the full self-driving beta, but it would be really useful for people who have insurance policies with Tesla insurance and want to have the cheapest monthly bill they possibly can. Uh, I have to hope that Tesla's working on some kind of a 2.0 revamp of the safety score system that does everything you're talking about. It just makes too much sense. David, thank you for your call. Thank you to everybody that took the time to call in. I will get to more of your phone calls next week, so feel free to keep those calls coming. But for now, the podcast is not yet done. I'll be right back with your pro tip of the week and more right after this. This is Steve Downs, the voice of Master Chief Sierra 117. You're listening to Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast. You know, that Cybertruck looks a lot like a warthog, doesn't it? Master Chief, out. I've got beta 10.69.2 of full self-driving in my car. Just some quick impressions, because I haven't actually had a chance to, to really put it through some tests. I'm, I plan to do that this weekend after I record this, obviously. But uh, I will say I've noticed some definite improvements in some spots that were previously not great. There's one in particular where, again, there's just weird little spots all over San Francisco. And there's one that I f uh, find myself at a lot where it's there's a dedicated right-hand turn lane, and then you make that right, and there's then two lanes, a left turn and a right turn, and it's literally 30 feet. It's like two car lengths to a stop sign to either, you're either going left or right. So basically it's, I'm on one road and I and then I'm trying to get onto a parallel road and uh, so it's a it's a light stopping at a light at the the initial road and then the right turn and then the immediate stop sign and then I need to make a left and uh, again it's a it's a stop a four way stop uh, there and the the two lanes you've got the left turn lane the right turn lane and previously you know there's so little room the car would try to get into that right hand, rightmost lane first when it made the, the right turn on from the first street onto the little connector. And it would have no room to then maneuver over to get into the left hand turn lane. And so it would freak out. It wouldn't, it would not do well. Well, I've run it through uh, this latest version, 10.69.2, and it handled it cleanly. So that that was just a weird, I mean, I I guess you'd call that an edge case because the, it was just such a short run. I can't imagine there are, there are many little sections of road that are literally like 
two car lengths long. Uh, so good job on that. But I, I definitely want to do some more testing with it this weekend. But, you know, like I was saying earlier in the podcast, I, it's this release. It really makes me think about the the macro, the, the larger time uh, time scale of this from when I first got into the beta 11 months ago to now. And it really has come a heck of a long way. So uh, I'm eager to see how it evolves from here. But certainly in the meantime, I want to get some more some more miles under me with with this version first. But it's uh, it's looking pretty good. It's looking like a nice improvement indeed. Hey, an entertainment recommendation for you. I am uh, definitely a Lord of the Rings fan. I love the books when I was a kid. Uh, the Hobbit was was a favorite book as well. So I Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings movie trilogy, I adore. It's three of my favorite movies ever. Uh, I think the extended versions are even better just because those books, there was so much in there that the four hour versions are are just fantastic. But the but then Peter Jackson's Hobbit trilogy, I was so disappointed by. <laughs> it was. The sh- one short book that they made into three three-hour movies, and it's just nope. This did not did not work for me, Peter Jackson. And so now coming into this Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power show, which Peter Jackson's not affiliated with, but obviously it's artistically, visually, it's taking it's taking not just a lot of inspiration. I mean, it is following Peter Jackson's sort of visual bible that that he made with those uh, ultimately six films. And I have to say, I'm very much enjoying The Rings of Power thus far. So if you enjoy Lord of the Rings, give it a shot. If you, if you have not looked at it already, it is it's uh, it is stunning to look at. I, I apologize. If I've mentioned this show, I might have mentioned it after the first episode, but it's it continues to impress me here after, after these first three or four episodes. So check it out if it's of interest. All right, time for a pro tip of the week. I go back to James from the Bay Area. He's got another one. Hey, Ryan, how's it going? James from the Bay Area here with a quick pro tip. Um, Yeah, on iPhones and iOS, I don't know about Android, but um, yeah, in the app, you can open it up and, you know, those four icons you have there, like uh, open the charging port door or go ahead and uh, turn on the fan speed or unlock the car. Anyways, if you long press on one of those, you can go ahead and edit them. You can swap them out for another one you may want or you can rearrange the order. So it's kind of cool. Maybe not everyone knew that, so I thought I'd put that out there. Now, technically, there is a way where you can add a fifth icon. So in that row, it will be five icons, and it'll also show on your widget as well. But um, the easiest way for me to explain that is if you go to YouTube and type in Tesla app fifth icon, and then, yeah, go ahead and enter that in the search, and you'll see a video there of a guy adding the fifth icon in that row. Um, I have it on my phone, so do my friends and family, my wife as well. We all have the fifth icon. It can be done. It's a little tricky, but it can be done. But the main pro tip, yes, you can go ahead and edit those four icons there. All right, Ryan. James, I humbly thank you for this call. This is a great tip. You have taught me something today, which I appreciate. I did not know that one. That's an excellent one. Thank you very much. And if anybody else out there has a pro tip of the week that they'd like to share with me in the audience, please feel free to send it in the same way that you send in a regular Ride the Lightning Hotline call. And kindly, please observe that 90-second rule for pro tip calls as well. Okay, before I get out of here, let me mention some friends of the podcast. Starting with abstractocean.com. Uh, Last week, I just jumped onto their website and started reading interesting products. I would encourage you to do the same. Take the time to do it. Uh, I won't run through that exercise again today, but abstractocean.com. Use the coupon code RTLPODCAST at checkout to get 15% off of your first order there. And then the snap plate, which you can find at everyamp.com slash RTL the front license plate bracket that I quite recommend in comparison to the one that Tesla gives you that uses automotive tape to stick to the front of your car. Oh, don't do that in case you ever want to take it off. Uh, The snap plate will come off easily, but when it's on, it will be on securely. They've got it for all four Teslas. Get yours at everyamp.com slash RTL. And then how about budget safe solar? So my design is, I'm in the permitting phase now. 
which is, of course, out of budget safe solar's hands and it's up to San Francisco and San Francisco is not known for their expediency when it comes to red tape. You know, you would think that a tech first city like this would have, you'd think the, I would think the opposite. They'd be like, oh, it, stuff like permits, they must have a great system for this. No, historically, it's it's really not, it's very messy <laughs> with San Francisco, but we'll see. I'm, I'm at their mercy now. But the system design is great. We are moving forward. And if you uh, want to find out more about solar for your home or business, contact Budget Safe Solar at budgetsafesolar.com because tomorrow your neighborhood may have reached its circuit capacity and not be able to handle another customer supplying that aged infrastructure until repairs are completed who knows how many years from now. So don't get shut out because you thought that roof of yours had one more year left in it, which, I mean, we found out the hard way. Ours <laughs> didn't have one more year left in it. Visit them today, budgetsafesolar.com. Use the referral code RTL if you do proceed with a solar installation. How about Immaculate Reflections? A fantastic detailer here in the greater San Francisco Bay Area. If you're going to be here, be in the Bay Area with your car, Book in some work with Jeff at Immaculate Reflections, whether it's ceramic coating, whether it's paint protection film over some or all of the car, whether it is paint correction or some combination of those or something else you've got in mind. Maybe you want to have your center console wrapped if you've got an older style like me. I guess the newer ones aren't really that wrappable. Uh, but the, if you got the older one like me, I actually, Jeff had a picture on his Instagram. He did a customer's car in white with white film. So it looked, it kind of uh, matched the appearance of the original silver alpha prototype model three. And I thought it matched in, in a white interior car. And I thought it looked really nice. I was like, oh, I, now I kind of wish I had done that. Instead, I just did, I did a satin film, satin clear so it's still black, but it just, mine doesn't do fingerprint, but it, you know, rejects fingerprints pretty well and certainly rejects scratches, which the, the piano black finish of those old center consoles would get scratched if you looked at them funny. Anyway, detailing at Immaculate Reflections, go there. You will not regret it. The, the website is irdetailing.com. That's how you get in touch with Jeff. And when you reach out through irdetailing.com, Mention that you're a Ride the Lightning listener, so if you do book in any work with Jeff, he will give you a nice little discount just for being a listener of this podcast, which I really appreciate him doing. PureTesla.com slash RTL, your one-stop shop for your dash cam and sentry mode setups. So glad that sentry, the uh, dash cam bug has been fixed now. Uh, it's fixed in the production, you know, the production version of the, of the software is obviously a bit ahead of where the full self-driving branch is when it terms when it comes to features and the uh, this 10.69.2 finally fixed that USB issue that would cause your your drive to not be recognized and it was a very frustrating situation now it's back to working reliably every single time again because I've got a pure tesla.com/rtl drive that's micro SD based which means it's built for the constant reading and writing that comes with the dash cam and the sentry mode setup. So get yours. It's 49 bucks shipped free anywhere in the US for the 128 gigabyte kit. If you want to do a 256 gig, that's $69. Comes fully formatted, out of the package, ready to go, works with Mac and PC. And again, they'll ship worldwide, but free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Get yours at puretesla.com slash RTL. And finally, Jada. They've got a bunch of center console-centric fun stuff, pro uh, products like the Jada USB Hub Console, which is a storage organizer USB hub, Apple Watch charger, and AirPod charger all in one. For those of you like me with an older Model 3, they also have the fourth generation wireless charging pad for your phone, which I very much recommend. I've got version three of theirs in my car and it works great, looks great, looks factory and you know, looks original, which I appreciate. So I've got a coupon code for you and I'll make you a deal. If you use the coupon code or if you use my referral link, I'll give you the coupon code for the discount. So the discount code is RTL. The referral link that I humbly ask that you use if you purchase anything from Jada 
uh, you got to use this code because then they'll throw me a couple of bucks from the sale to you know let say that it's a thank you for you coming in from Ride the Lightning. The website is getjada.com slash R-E-F slash eight. And Jada there is spelled J-E-D-A. Getjada.com slash R-E-F slash eight. And I mentioned the Patreon at the top, but just real quick, patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. Patreon spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. I won't I won't stoop so low as to say it's my birthday, but you know, I will say if you have been listening to the podcast for a while, enjoying the podcast for a while, and maybe thinking about, ah, maybe I'll support Ryan at some point, well, maybe now's the time. I do put a lot of hard work into this podcast each and every week. I've got the receipts to prove it by virtue of, you can look through the entire archive. You will see the shows stamped, timestamped every seven days like clockwork. This is episode 372 I'm here for you every week. Hopefully you enjoy the podcast. I mean, if you've made it this far, odds are you're enjoying a decent part of it. So uh, if you do want to voluntarily support my efforts with the podcast at some point, you can do that on the Patreon page where there are different perks associated with the different support tiers. The higher you go, all the perks stack, you get more and more perks as you go up. I mentioned the one-on-one hangout call with uh, with Lawton from Chicago. Lawton is very generously at the Roadster in Space tier, which is the highest tier. Technically, there is one higher tier. It's like a secret tier. Um, but the Roadster in Space tier is, uh, is, is sort of the top one. And you get the one-on-one call with me every month if you elect to, to use it. You get the group call every month. You get your name shouted out at the end of the show like I'm about to do. You get the weekly bonus lightning round mini episodes, and you get the early access to the show as well. So I, I try to try to say thank you at each tier, and it stacks. So again, patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. If you would like to follow me on social media, my handle is DMC underscore Ryan on both Twitter and and Instagram. And I think, well, you can email me anytime. My email address is teslapodcast at gmail.com. And now I think that'll about do it. Other than to say, if you're not already following the podcast, subscribing to it on your favorite podcast service, you can do that for free on any of the big podcast services. All that's doing is pushing the show out to you every time there's a new episode, which of course, like clockwork, is every Sunday at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific. You can follow slash subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Spotify, which are available natively in your Tesla. And then there is audio only on YouTube. There is no video, but if you do want to listen on YouTube, I've got a channel there. Just search Ride the Lightning Tesla, and you'll find me pretty easily. All right, before I get going... Let me say hello and thank you to the newest Maximum Plaid tier backer, Doug Carey. Doug, thank you so much. And then the rest of the Maximum Plaid backers, we've got Jonathan Wales, Cameron Clark, Daniel Grummer, Seth Capello, Nick and Tony, the Galpin family, Ryan from Las Vegas, Darren Nickel, Kaz Barnes, Ulrich Lassa, Brett Libano, Patrick Wisniewski, Gil Cabrera, Watley, Eric Brown, Mark Eversoll, Todd Badger, Joe Edgel, Kevin Yank, the Tesla Owners Club of San Joaquin Valley, Michael Williams, Will Stedman, Mait Suaru, Derek Nesselrote, Justin Perez, Jeremy Harris, Chris Beach, Tom Mills, Alex Brem, Tyler Smith, Corey O'Donnell, Matthew Graham Droneberger, Scott Gillis, Aaron, John Cody, Andre Kent, Joel Sapp, Kim Bay, Paul Casarino, Richard Corley, Chris Osborne, KB, Matt Asbury, We Drive Tesla EV Luxury Car Rental in Oahu, HaloBengals.com, Chris Pratt, and Ken Epstein. The aforementioned Roadster in Space tier, they are Pete White, Lyle Austin, Steve Radspinner, Fernando Cordero, Lawton from Chicago, Sean Neidig, Neil Weaver, Jackson Wallace, Rolf and Jennifer Evers, Howard Anthony Smith, Victoria Iacovetto, Tesla Hitchhiker 42, and Kara Weston. 
And finally, the grandfathered in, the retired tier, the plaid tier, but the retired, uh, excuse me, the grandfathered folks in from that who've been pledging at that tier for a while, they, their pledges are continued to be honored and they continue to get the, the perks with that one. The plaid crew, we have George Cassioppo, David Brander, Logan Willis, Jason Chalukas, Tim Hyde, Peter Chalet, Eric Randolph, Dory and Steve Guberman, Jeremy, the Tesla owners of Taiwan, Ron Lee, Charlie Gillespie, David Perella, Dennis Peak, Jeff Angwin, Chase Cabanillas, the Lydia family, Aaron Altschul, Jared Brown, Jerome Strack, Jamie Dalton, the Tesla owners East Bay Club, Mike and Barbara from Louisville, David J. Howes, Travis Krenzel, Matt Nixon, the Tesla Owners Club of Wisconsin, Jonathan Zelezny, Ish, not Elon Musk, T. Kirk Lowry, Peter, the Bear Boys of Colorado, and Raven Wolf Retro Tech. Thanks to all of you. And with that, we have come to the end of another Ride the Lightning. This was episode 372. I wish you all happy electric motoring over this next week. And of course, I'll be back with you in one week's time. I'll see you then. I mean, I think a Tesla is the most fun thing you could possibly buy ever. That's what it's meant to be. Our goal is to make... It's, it's not exactly a car. It's actually a thing to maximize enjoyment. It's maximum fun.